It is great to see everyone this morning. It's good to have our visitors with us today. If uh, you did not get a, an outline, I understand that we ran out. Would you raise your hand? They have made some more. If you would like an outline, you have not gotten one. I don't see any hands, so I guess everybody has one. <clears throat> let's take our Bibles, and if you're not already open to Acts chapter 8, let's go there, because the text of my lesson will be taken from this chapter. All that is known about this man called the Ethiopian eunuch is revealed to us right here in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39 that was read. <clears throat> now, if we notice in verse 27, it speaks of this man's background. It says, Behold a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Here was a man of great authority. Evidently, this man was a, probably a, a foreign-born Jew or maybe just a proselyte, but he had traveled over 1,000 miles to worship God in the city of Jerusalem according to Old Testament law. The queen under consideration here, whom he served, is really not named. In fact, the term Candace is actually a title that was given to the rulers of Ethiopia, much like the title Pharaoh was given to the rulers of Egypt. Now, some things, of course, are a mystery to us. God has not revealed every single thing to us in this book because the world could not contain it if he tried to. But inspiration really saw no need to give us the name of this Ethiopian eunuch because really it's not that important. It certainly would not change the outcome of the lesson to be taught here. But there are so many things, there are many things that are important to us that has been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit for our benefit. Now, first of all, a very important thing to notice about this great and noble man is his attitude towards spiritual things. And I want to notice three things that reveal his attitude. First of all, we do notice that this eunuch is a sincere seeker. He was like that merchant man that Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 through 46, who went about seeking goodly pearls. Now, as the eunuch studied and learned more as to what God required of him, he would readily pay the price of acceptance. But we have to understand also that sincerity alone does not prove our love to God. His having traveled such a great distance to be able to worship God is an indication that he thought that what he was doing is what God required of him to do. Surely he believed that what he was doing was right, to pay such a high price, both monetarily and physically, to be able to make this trip to Jerusalem. But you know the Bible teaches that it is sincerity plus obedience to God's pattern that God has given us that is necessary for us to receive the blessings of God and to prove our love to him. Because you remember what Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. That's how we prove our love to God, is keeping his commandments, doing what God says to do. We also notice something about this eunuch is that he was a lowly learner. As Philip the evangelist arrived at the chariot of this Ethiopian eunuch, he noticed that he was reading his, uh, his Bible from the book of Isaiah. I was trying to say Isaiah, but Isaiah. Now the question that was asked by Philip and the eunuch's response indicated the sincerity and the humility of this queen's treasure. In verses 30 and 31 of our text, it says, And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, Understandest what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So this man here, this eunuch, willingly confessed his ignorance pertaining to the text that he was reading from, and he also earnestly showed his desire to understand what he was actually reading. So he had that same noble attitude that the Bereans had in that they readily received the word of God. Now we notice something about this eunuch and the Bereans together is that they were both noble in that they engaged in the searching and examining of the scriptures. 
that they were both anxious for accurate answers as to the meaning and the proper application of the text, and both show their sincerity and their love in their proper response to God's word in that they accepted the truth into their lives. This man, this eunuch, is a great example to us as to how we need to react to the preaching of God's word also, that we need to learn what it is, understand the truth, and accept that truth into our lives. We don't need to be just hearers only, but we also have to be doers. But there's another thing that revealed the attitude of the eunuch, and that is that he was a faithful follower. Now, to be a faithful follower, one has to, just like the eunuch, have an open and an honest heart. When I'm talking about the Bible heart, I'm talking about this right here, the mind. This is just an old blood pump. But this is the Bible heart, and it is supposed to be honest, and it is to be, supposed to be open. Faithfulness to God demands that we accept what is written in his book according to that which is given, and we are to make a change in our lives. It doesn't matter what I've been taught all of my life. It doesn't matter what I've been taught by someone who's very near and dear to me. What I need to know is what God said, because that's what's going to matter when judgment comes. An honest heart is willing to change if the evidence demands it. But having an honest heart alone still is not enough. The eunuch's heart was also attuned to an open Bible. Now, a truly honest heart will be, of course, regulated by the pattern of truth. Our desire will be to do God's will, what God has told us to do. We need to have the attitude of the psalmist. And I think this is the attitude that the eunuch had. What we read of in Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Open-mindedness and an open Bible are both essential ingredients to become a faithful follower of God. But there's another ingredient in his faithful following, was that there was a man with an open mouth explaining the scriptures to him. In verse 35 of our text, it says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now this very clearly indicates to all of us that it takes more than just preaching the, plan, the man, you also have to preach the plan. When Philip preached Jesus to the eunuch, we notice that he preached the pattern that was purchased by the Savior's blood. In Matthew 26, verse 28, we notice that Jesus shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And this is what, of course, Philip preached to him. He preached the pattern that was pe preached to those on the day of Pentecost by Peter and the other apostles in Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. It's the same pattern that was preached to Saul of Tarsus by Ananias in Acts 22, verse 16. It is the same pattern that was preached by Paul everywhere and in every church, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17. It's the same pattern that we find Philip also preaching to the Samaritans in the previous verses here in Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. Everywhere that Jesus Christ was preached, it is the exact same message. It did not vary from individual to individual. It did not vary from congregation to congregation. And of course, the pattern that God desired back then, it's the same pattern that God demands today because nothing has changed since that time and it will not change till the end of the world. To produce faithful followers of God, the man and his plan both have to be preached. And it's not just enough to follow it, we have to follow it faithfully. The Ethiopian eunuch, he is dead and gone. But his example and his attitude yet speak to us today. Now, the eunuch's Bible and his employment of it played a tremendous role in his conversion to Jesus Christ. We do notice that the eunuch did possess a Bible. He was reading from it on his way back from Jerusalem. Now, the eunuch could have reasoned from uh, natural revelation to obtain a knowledge of God. In fact, the psalmist said long ago in Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Or as what Paul said there in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, 
being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that we are without excuse. The natural creation clearly points to a divine creator, but it takes special revelation for us to know what God specifically wants from us to be his faithful followers. Now, the Ethiopian eunuch, as well as men today, they need the truth to save them from their sins. Jesus clearly said in John 8, verse 32, that it is the truth that sets man free. It sets us free from the bondage of sin. Men need a Bible today, and they need to possess it, just like that eunuch did. They need a translation of the Holy Scriptures in their language that conveys the message of the original autographs. We don't need a paraphrase. We don't need man's opinions or theological bias inserted within a text. We don't need a leather-bound book that has Bible written on it unless it truly is the truth of God. The special revelation of God, the power has the, or has the power to convert the soul, Psalm 19, verse 7. But here's something else about this eunuch in his Bible is that he read his Bible. And that's a challenge for each and every one of us today. It's not enough merely just to own a copy of the Bible, but it has to be read and it also has to be understood. Dusty Bibles on the shelves, they don't have any conversion power. Neither do Bibles whose owners only read just a few verses of it in a haphazard fashion without any understanding at all. The eunuch read and with some help he understood God's will for man. You know, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 4, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. All men need to urgently and earnestly read and understand the truth in their lives so that they can have salvation. Otherwise, there will be none. Now this eunuch, he read the Bible and noticed something that this Bible did for him. It took him to worship. The eunuch was a worshiping man. He had been all the way to Jerusalem and now he was returning according to verses 27 and 28. Now remember, under the law of Moses, all the participants, the males, about 20 years and up, had to go to Jerusalem three times a year for worship. During Passover, during Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of the Tabernacles. Apparently, the eunuch had been there for one of these times. But also, we have to understand that at this point in time, we're in the New Testament, remember, that the old law has already been abolished. That happened at Christ's cross when he took that old law and he nailed it to the cross and took it out of the way, Colossians 2 verse 14. So that old law is no longer in effect. So this eunuch is only considering a part of God's law and therefore he was in error in the type of worship that he was offering unto God. Was he religious? Yes. Was he sincere? Absolutely but he was sincerely and religiously wrong because he failed to handle the word of God aright. You know, there's so many people today just like that eunuch. They're sincere, and they are religious, and their Bible takes them to some type of worship. But their worship is in ignorance because they don't serve God according to the pattern that's given to us in the New Testament. Men today have to understand that we are to worship and we are to serve God under the law in which we live. Remember what Jesus said in John 4 verse 24? That we are to worship God and we are to worship him in spirit and in truth. Taking all of God's word into consideration and handling it aright is the only way to overcome vain worship. Now God's people, of course, they need to let their Bibles take them to worship. They need to read and obey the Bible in order to be in a right relationship with God and to be able to worship Him acceptably. They need to let their Bibles authorize their actions in worship and also in life, which of course would take them to worship. And if they would do this, then there would be no factions, there would be no divisions, and then true unity would then reign among men. 
the, Bible, the Unix Bible took him to worship over 1,000 miles away. How far will your Bible take you? Will it take you just a few blocks or even that far? And how often will your Bible take you to worship? Now, the eunuch made a decision that was based upon the Bible. Now, to be saved, of course, the eunuch had to know something about Jesus. And that's exactly what Philip did. He preached unto him Jesus. Beginning in the scriptures there in Isaiah, he began to preach to this eunuch, the man that would save his soul, the Savior of the world. Now, the eunuch not only had to know something about Christ, but he also had to know how to get into Christ. And again, that's what Philip did, because he taught him about the necessity of baptism. Did you know there's only two verses in the whole Bible that tell us how to get into Christ? They're found in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, and Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. And both of them say that we're baptized into Christ. The only way to get into Christ where all spiritual blessings are found, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Now, we don't hear exactly what Philip said about baptism, but we do know that he taught about it. Because as they were traveling along, it says that they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So no doubt, if we preach Jesus Christ, we also have to preach the baptism for remission of sins, just like Peter and the apostles did on the day of Pentecost, just like Ananias did with Saul of Tarsus, just like Peter, or Philip did with the eunuch. And then based upon what was taught in the scriptures, this eunuch acted upon it to make a life-changing decision. Now, the text says that the Ethiopian nobleman was in charge of all the treasure belonging to the queen of Ethiopia. Now, the type of jewels that he was in charge of, that's not given to us in the scriptures. The value of these jewels is also not given to us. What the text does reveal is that this man was seeking God and what he found was the real treasure, the pearl of great price. Now, the most valuable treasures that we have on this earth, you're not going to find them in hidden chests. You're not going to find them behind guarded doors. What this man found is a treasure he found out in the desert, in an unpopulated area. The Ethiopian, he was searching out this treasure, and Philip happened to be the key which opened his understanding to God's great truth. You know, what a privilege it is that we have such a great storehouse of, of revelation that was given by God to mankind. And it's right here in, in this book that we call the Bible. Every opportunity to have one's understanding open to this treasure should be eagerly seized. We should be wanting, desiring to understand what God has said to us. Because we're not going to go to heaven if we don't know what God says to do. Philip knew that having a correct understanding of God's word was important, and so he ran to this man to help him dig for God's treasure. God's people also need to avail themselves to every opportunity to help someone to understand this great treasure so that they too can be saved. You know, a jewel is actually a precious stone, and there is none more precious than Jesus Christ himself. In fact, Jesus is described throughout the scriptures as that rejected stone. Psalm 118, verse 22. Acts chapter 4, verse 11. He's described as that spiritual rock. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And also that foundational rock upon which he was going to build his church. Matthew 16, verses 16 through 18. These are some of the, a few of the, just the precious gems that sparkled before the eunuch's eyes as he was reading the scriptures. And it's what Philip was explaining to him. There is no treasure that can even compare to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and being in his kingdom. I want you to listen to the words of the wise man many years ago in Proverbs 20, verse 15. There is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. 
Christ is precious because of his very being, because of who he is, and because of what he has done for you and I. If only the knowledge of Christ would sparkle in our eyes like it did in the heart of the eunuch that day as Philip was explaining those scriptures. Upon the eunuch's obedience to the truth of God's word, we're told in verse 39 that there was great joy. You know, Satan can deceive man into thinking that sinful pleasures are really all the joys that we need in this world. And the world seeks for enjoyment, but it's usually based upon external circumstances. And, of course, they do oftentimes find temporary satisfaction. Sin does that. We're told about the, that sin does give pleasure. Uh, Hebrews 10 verse 25 talks about the, the, sinful, the pleasures of sin for a season, but they only last for a little while. Many find temporary satisfaction in sin, but the thing is, they will always end up with fearful, eternal consequences. Sin does not bring us closer to God, it separates us from our God. And yes, they may seem pleasurable for a while, for a season, but they quickly vanish away. Being submissive to God is the only thing that will bring internal and external joy and peace. Despite the circumstances that we have to live in this life. So with the right attitude, the Ethiopian nobleman, he searched the right way for the right treasure. Now to start with, he was sincere and he was religious, but there was no doubt that he was lost. But through his continued sincerity and his diligence to be able to search the scriptures, through the help of Philip, he found salvation in Christ Jesus. Now the same gospel that he obeyed back then is the same gospel that is available to us today. Like I said, it's not going to change as long as this world lasts. Now, he believed the scriptures and what the scriptures said about Jesus Christ. And he was willing to change his worship and his ways according to the pattern of God's word. That's what we call repentance. And he confessed Jesus Christ with his mouth that he was the son of God. And he was baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. And it wasn't until that point that he found true joy. There is no joy outside of Christ, only sin and death. But through Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made on our behalf, we had the opportunity of eternal life in heaven with God forever. But we have to submit to his pattern just like the eunuch did. There is someone here this morning who has never named the name of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're not in Christ because you've never been baptized into Christ according to the scriptures, according to the pattern given by God. You have that opportunity this morning. If you are a child of God and things are not right in your life, we encourage you to make that change before it is eternally too late. You have the opportunity right now once you respond to the invitation while together we stand and sing.